Hi, and thank you so much for clicking on the Justin Root Show, which at this point may as well be called the Nightmare on Elm Street Show, because <laughs> in addition to the cast of part four and yes. Mr. Mark Patton, I now have the OG, the original queen, the one who laid the groundwork for any of those people to even come here, and someone who has two Academy Awards in her house, which I'm going to find out about too. Please welcome Miss Heather Langenkamp. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I cannot tell you how grateful I am. Well, I'm sorry it took me so long to get onto your show. What? It's very hard. It's very hard. You have to, you know, call and ask, when is my date? When am I going to get to be on your show? Years in advance. I'm really right? excited. All right, if you had a show, who, who would you geek out over? There's so many. But I'd probably invite like William Hurt, like somebody really? like yeah, like I really admire his acting so much, or Helen Mirren, probably Amazing. somebody like that. You know, I appreciate the people that I watched growing up, and I watched them a lot. Like, how do they do that? Well, Tulsa, right, Oklahoma, Tulsa. born there, born there, and, and I went to school there until ninth grade. And then I went to school in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. for high school then? Yeah, all okay. for high school. Like, where did the acting bug come? You know, my first, that first actor that I watched who I really thought, wow, I really like this show was Little House on the Prairie. Really? When I saw Melissa Gilbert, one, I kind of looked like her. We had like brown hair and she would wear braids. And, yeah. you know, I just really, really admired the job she did on that show. And I was such a huge fan of that show. Really? And of course, the Brady Bunch and we would watch all of the sitcoms. That's what I grew up on. Very wholesome, not very violent, not a lot of guts and gore and blood. And horror movies were really something that I had no familiarity with. Sure. Probably the first horror movie I saw was Burnt Offerings. So yes. Karen Black became like the... Uh, horror in terms of horror like that's the face I see when I think of a horror movie and, and in fact that's a movie that I just truly love to this day though I don't think people would classify it as horror it doesn't have any blood and guts it's just kind of psychological horror mm. and but that's what I love Jaws was probably the first scary movie that I saw it at a theater where I, I couldn't sleep. I wasn't allowed to see you know Texas Chainsaw Massacre for sure or Halloween. I went to an an all girls school in Washington DC where none mm. of my girlfriends were into horror. So, you know, those movies came and went. I didn't even know they existed. Going to school with political figures, daughters and sons, because there was a boys school right across the street. So, you know, Jesse Jackson's son and Walter Mondale's son oh. and a lot of congressmen's daughters and sons. A lot of my friends are now in government. And, you know, I must seem like such a freaky weirdo compared to like what my friends are doing. And they, you know, we always laugh about it because moving to California alone is considered really strange. Sure. And becoming a horror movie scream queen is considered the ultimate strangeness. But then once you're in the business and we're out here, then we think of those people as the weirdos. They're the weirdos. Yeah, right? I look at what's going what's on. Like, what are they there. thinking? It's a horror movie over there, right? It's like yeah. Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah. I mean, the Would Swamp Thing. Yeah. We're like watching it play out in real life yeah. every day. I think I'd rather be a scream queen <laughs> than the president right now. That's, you yeah. know. What's sad <laughs> is that there is such a divide between the political world and the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like there's a place for for artistry and creativity in our government, but lately it has not been, you know, brought together. And I hope that someday we have leaders that do really appreciate the arts much more than they do now. Hey Amen. You know, it's one thing to dream. Yeah. I'm going to go to California, I'm going to be an actor, I'm going to be a star. And it's another thing to actually do it. Can you pinpoint any specific thing that made you think, you know what? I'll try I'm it. I'm going to do this. Well, I was lucky because I, after my senior year in Washington, D.C., that summer I went to Tulsa because my dad had, you know, he was in the Carter administration. So he had moved back to Tulsa and brought our family back there. They were making Rumblefish and the Outsiders in Tulsa that summer. Francis Ford Coppola brought, like, every cute guy in Hollywood to Tulsa. You had not only Patrick Swayze, you had Rob the whole Lowe. cast. So you had Rob Lowe, you had Matt Dillon, you had Vince Spano, you had yeah. this incredible group of actors come and so every girl wanted to be an extra in these films so I went down to the casting office and I said I you know I'm signing up to be an extra they brought me in as an extra on the outsiders and then there was an opportunity to read for a part in Rumblefish and I read for a part didn't really get it but my girlfriend was called in to be an extra in a wedding scene 
And I went with her because her mom wouldn't let her go to this bad neighborhood at night. And she called and said, can I bring Heather Langenkamp? And the casting director was like, oh yeah, you can bring her down. From just a, the twist of fate, I got a speaking part and my SAG card that night. Oh. So once I had my SAG card and I was going to college at Stanford, I said, you know what? On weekends, I'll just fly down to LA and I'll see if that casting director will help me. So Janet Hershenson was her name and she became my manager and she got me lots of great auditions and she let me live at her house. I mean, she was so instrumental in helping me. My sophomore year at Stanford, I decided to move and actually like get an apartment. Oh. That's when I got Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh my gosh. That's so, incredible. And it you was had Francis Ford Coppola on your resume. Do you, yeah, it, it, that was probably more helpful for a while. I mean, having that little part, even though it never made the film, mm -hmm. Having that on my resume in the beginning was very important. And actually being in Nightmare on Elm Street never really did help me ever. And people would always want to talk about Francis Ford Coppola and nobody knew Wes Craven. Yeah. That was not a big deal. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the people advising me were like, you know, maybe we should take this off your resume. Wow. It's not gonna, it's not gonna help you to be in a horror movie. Wow. So it was a different time completely. Different. And everyone was really striving to be in film, trying to get in, a the John Hughes film, that would have been like the pinnacle, sure. right? Sure. Or Christopher Columbus film. Mm -hmm. The Adventures in Babysitting, I remember. I was so close. Do were you? I like really wanted that part so badly. Uh. And uh, all the parts I really wanted, I look back on and go, wow, if I had gotten that part instead of Nancy, I would have had a totally different kind of career. Would have, could have, should have. Yeah. I mean, one of the worst things we I can know. You just, fill our heads you with. You can't. You can't you think can't, back. You can't. And I'm so grateful for the part that yeah. I did play. I, I, I've you know, I count my blessings every day to have been cast as Nancy. Yeah. Do you remember the audition well? I Very heard, well. Is it true? Very I mean, well. I heard you have, you beat up Demi Moore, Courtney Cox, I don't Cox, really think so. Jennifer Grey, really? I don't, I don't remember That's seeing just, any of those gals, never. Yeah. Did you read with anyone? Any so I read with Amanda Wiss. Oh, you Amanda did? Amanda both got the part, and oh. uh, Amanda was reading for Tina, and we were sitting on a couch just like this, and we, and Wes was over there, and we read, and we did, you know, our best, obviously, and Wes said, Congratulations, you have the part right there. Right then and there. Right then and there. That doesn't happen. No, it was really, really rare. Wow. It was great. And I went home and I wrote my diary. I got it. You did? Oh, you know, yeah. It's such a cliche question, but I mean, did you all get along the cast? And was it just a bunch of fun kids getting their first jobs? And Well, you know, Amanda Wiss, she was very experienced. I mean, she had been an actor since she was 13. So she offered a lot of guidance. And then, of course, Robert, he was so experienced too. But Johnny and I were brand new and I was a little more experienced. I had done maybe two big productions before this. So, you know, I would sometimes whisper to Johnny, like, you know, that mark, you make sure you sit down on your mark and that's so otherwise you won't be in focus. And he'd be like, okay. Wow, you, know? you gave Or advice. I give Johnny like a couple of tips and I'm like, if you're going to scream, like tell the sound man because they get really mad if you like raise your volume and you haven't told them that you're going to do that because they're, you know, their eardrums can yeah. get. So the two things I knew about filmmaking, I passed on to Johnny <laughs> and then everything else. I was just such a newbie. You know, I was listening to Robert, Robert gave me so much good advice you know he really showed me like how the camera can really help you mm -hmm. when you're in our fight scenes we would always practice a lot so that you know once the camera was rolling we would have a lot of you know dynamics and things that looked interesting like a lot of times you see horror movies and the movement is just terrible mm -hmm. you know people aren't acting like they're really scared and yeah. they don't have good body movements and it looks very stilted and stiff and robert made sure we didn't like you know, look that way. And I love, of course, the feminism behind it, especially when it comes to your wardrobe, <laughs> even your pajama <laughs> scenes and stuff. I'm very modest. You're I covered from head to toe throughout the whole entire thing. And horror movies have a notoriety of flesh yeah, and skin and flesh. boobs and all that I mean, I think stuff. that was more about Wes Craven's religious upbringing and really? then his... Like, his personal modesty level was very high. I think sexuality gets in the way of messaging. If you are someone like Wes, who has a message he wants to get across, thrusting Nancy in there as this very sexualized creature would have taken away from his desire, I think, to see her as a powerful person. Mm -hmm. Though, you know, nowadays, 
There's a lot of really sexy women who are also very powerful. But back then, it would have been a really confusing message. We didn't pick those clothes because they were really covering up. We really felt like those were outfits that kids wore. We just didn't want to make her the sexy girl. And it's kind of similar to the way we dressed Marie and just the 10 of us is that like there's a lot of girls in America who just don't want to be sexy. Like they don't want that to be the first thing people notice about them. So it comes out. I'm imagining you have a screening before the premiere, right? They didn't really have a premiere no. for that movie, unfortunately. I mean, it would have been so much fun mm -hmm. to have a premiere, but instead they showed it at Warner Brothers in one of just their small screening rooms. And what's going through your mind? You're starring in a film. I was thinking like, oh gosh, I hope people like it. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you know, horror movies, I didn't know, like, are these going to be a big hit or not? So I, I, I guess I saw it that night and then I was living with a gal in Hollywood Hollywood and um, the movie comes out and I just am not paying attention and she's like Heather the movie did really well last weekend and I'm like what do you mean she's like I think I made a lot of money and I'm like it did she's like yeah let's go get the Hollywood Reporter and so we went down to the market and we bought the Hollywood Reporter and I opened it up and it was like made four million dollars last weekend and I was like wow but you know no one my phone didn't ring I mean I don't know why but it was a very kind of a, it came and went, mm, you know, really? and I would go back and forth to Stanford once you know, whenever I had free time. And, um, I went to see it in Oakland and my eyes were open about how much people loved it when I finally saw it in a theater because the whole audience was like yelling at Freddie and telling me to run. And it was like such a uh, audience participation. It was great. And Oakland is such a great place to see a horror movie because they uh, get so into it. I remember someone on the campus stopped me and said, Oh, I saw it. You're in that movie. Oh my gosh. But it only happened once. So I, my judgment of it was that some people were seeing it and really liking it, but it wasn't like a mainstream hit. Nightmare on Elm Street did not make me a star. And, um, I know, but nobody ever really believes me when I say that. But the movie didn't really become popular, I'd say, until about you know the early 90s when people had VCRs and was watch were watching it at home. You weren't even asked to be in the sequel, right? Like, no. Nobody no, was. no. It was just a completely different project. Yes. It yes. came out. It obviously did really well. But then part three comes. But then, yeah, Wes gets back involved. And uh, he loves Nancy and Freddie together, so... He really came up with a really great idea. I Any thought. hesitation to sign on and do Not it? at all. Zero. No. And he Zero called you hesitation. personally, I read. Yeah, so he called me and I was sad that he wasn't going to be directing it because mm -hmm. I know... So I was a little bit wary and I did get involved with some of the casting sessions. I got to meet some of the kids when they were... Oh, okay. I read some of the parts oh, with, cool. it, with uh, like Patricia. I read a scene with her. when Before we even started, we got all the cast together and we had a real a nice afternoon where we talked about all the research being done about dreams and um, lucid dreaming. Oh, wow. And we did a, a lot of reading of the script together. So that kind of broke the ice and got us all to know each other before we started shooting. Oh, well, that's cool. Now, this time it's a phenomenon. You're yeah, it's big right one. now. It's yeah, big. Yeah. It's bigger. And bigger. Yeah, so... The budgets still were kind of small. Uh -huh. And um, because I had so many cast members, obviously. Sure. But it was a, a really grueling, grueling shoot. It was, And was they were in great? locations that were just... Like we shot at the Veterans Hospital here in Los Angeles. That was a kind of an abandoned building that they oh, okay. rented out. So it was really, it was a sad building. I mean, you, you could really feel like that it had been a place of real sadness darkness. and darkness. So, I mean, it helps in a way. And we did like, you know, the special effects in that movie were kind of groundbreaking. So that was always really exciting to work on. Some of the um, plate shots, like when I fall through the chair, that was like one of the first times Best that a plate shot had been used like that, and it looked so good. And there was a lot of fun on that movie with those, you know, with my co-stars on that. You know, my story is not that much different than the hundreds mm -hmm. and thousands of stories that you have heard over the years from your fans. Boy who got bullied, didn't yeah. fit in at school, horror was my escape. Are you oversaturated with these stories or does it still mean something when somebody says to you like... I'm so glad that, I mean, I have to say is that I love listening to people's stories because, I mean, people talking to each other is really all that life is about, really. And what pains me is that our culture has been so cruel 
to certain kids in this world. But also, you know, I thought back in my own history, like, oh, I remember this happening to me, and that was a bullying event. I mean, I never really thought of it. No one said the word bullying, but like, I remember an event where it was science class, and we all come in, and everyone has a birthday invitation from one of the students on their desk but me. I was devastated. And I just realized, like, that girl was just mean. She just had something against me. And later, that girl, actually, she ended up getting very sick. And I remember my friend told me, like, it was like six years later, oh, that girl is really sick. And it made me feel terrible. And I actually went to her house and sat with her, you know, because, you know, she had cancer. And I remember thinking to myself, like, this girl bullied me, but now she has cancer. And... Like how the world will just turn on a dime. You know, at one point she has all this power and can make me feel awful. But on the next moment, like I need to figure out how to get over it and actually try to be a friend to her. There is a moment in your life when you can turn it around and you can actually bridge a gap that you thought you never could. And so I always hope that people who did have such terrible experiences in their life, my hope for them is that this strength that maybe Nancy can give them is to actually be so above it, be so beyond the hurt that you can actually be the kind of person that you want to model for everybody. I love hearing the stories because I know how painful they are. I mean, my story is like so pathetic compared to theirs, but I was able to also say whatever it takes to rise above it and be the better man or woman is kind of the goal of, of what it is to be a really great person. You worked with Wes Craven at the beginning of his career, and then 10 years later, New Nightmare. A whole decade went by. Yeah. In a nutshell, what are some of the differences on set from 84 to 94? Well, I mean, it was a way more ambitious movie in so many ways. But Wes was, um, you know, he had more assistants. You know, he had people helping him. Sure. You know, everybody knew what they were doing, and... People were so good at their jobs. Freddie looked so much more menacing. And mm -hmm. In general, Wes was still the same. I mean, he's, like I said, he's an intellectual. He's very modest. He doesn't work to make you feel like he's the most important person in the room. His ego to me was always um, just right. He was an authoritarian when he needed to be. He was kind when he needed to be. He was funny when he needed to be. He just knew how hard I worked for him. He always would compliment me in this way that I found so touching. Like he would just give me such confidence that I was doing a good job. And sometimes I don't think directors know that that can go a long way. At the end of the day, they kind of pat the actor on the back and go, you did a great job today, you know, and maybe I'm insecure and I need that, but it would give me so much strength for the next day to go and do my very best work and try as hard as I could to make him happy. And the nice thing was is that he would always let me know that I was doing what he wanted me to do and that he was happy. Now I'm switching gears completely because this is honestly like the question I've been really dying to ask you. Really? Yes. You work with Joanne Woodward. Yes. In Passions. Yes. Did you ever meet Paul Newman? No. Oh! Uh, what, a, what a tragedy. But we made that movie here in LA. Was it before? And I think that they lived on the East Coast. They did, yeah, yeah. They lived yeah, on okay. the East Coast. So he was back home, but she, I mean, she was the first real yeah. movie star I ever worked with. And I really learned so much from her. I watched her like a hawk. I watched how she prepared for her scenes. I watched how, like, what she did between scenes to keep her mind just kind of calm. She would knit. Um, she was very, of course, political. So, you know, she always was up on the latest news and she just really was such an intelligent person. And also her training, you know, she really relied on it. If you have routines and things that you do on set that keep your mind focused on your parts. And, you know, one thing I just noticed right now is, you know, because of this smartphone, people really spend a lot of time between their scenes just completely in another world, like just texting and messaging and watching, you know, videos and stuff. I've never been the kind of person that could go back and forth like that. I always felt like, okay, I'm here. I better concentrate. I need to just calm my mind and all of those things. So I learned that from Joanne Woodward. 
When did Just the Ten of Us come about? That was that was right after three. Um, three. And your yeah. co-star Brooke Thies was on this. Yeah, yeah. So she was on four. Yeah. yeah, she was in four. So how was sitcom life? <laughs> sitcom life is like heaven. You have this group of people that I mean, if you didn't like your co-stars, then it would be hell. Ooh, yeah. So, but we had such a great cast and just laugh, uh, uh, laughs and more laughs and then acting and laughs and bunch you know, of and then you have live girls. audience and they get applause. I mean, like everything an actor wants, you've got and yeah. it was just a pure joy every single day we loved doing it and we had really great ratings too it was such a real shock I mean kind of a shock you never can tell with shows sure. but it seemed to be really well liked as a show oh my god it was my yeah. it was, you were like the original TGIF I know it was such a fun night on TV <sighs> and was, kids kids oh relied on us for their entertainment on Friday night what else were they going to do I was you know, one of I think it was a big it was a too bad. That's all I can say. I was watching a bunch of clips recently. It's so cute. Matt LeBlanc popped up. Oh yeah, I no, Matt and there. Matthew Perry. And Matthew Perry too. And he was on it. I mean, a lot of people were on that show. And, and you know, Dennis Haysbert had a That's regular right. part. Yeah, he did. And then, of course, Sid Haig, who's just a, such a doll, and he mm -hmm. just passed away. He played Janitor Bob. So, oh, that's, yeah. I mean, we got to meet so many great actors on that show, too. And same with Matt Shackman, who played my brother. He's gone on to be this very famous director and does so much work in town now. Do you really still fun. talk to him? I mean, you see Brooke at... Oh, of course I see Brooke a lot. I see Joanne Willette. She was a nightmare girl. She was part two. But yeah, once in a while, we try to get together. Jamie Lunar. Oh, yeah, Jamie Lunar. Oh, gosh, I owe her a little text. She texted me not long ago. <laughs> she was on my other favorite show, Melrose Place. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. I want to know, aside from the uncanny resemblance, how Nancy Kerrigan came along. You played Nancy Kerrigan in the Tanya Harding Nancy Kerrigan story. Yes. I actually was in doing Nightmare 7. The producer of Nightmare called the casting director and said, you know, Heather really wants to come in. And they're like, oh, of course, have her come in. And so I dressed up like Nancy Kerrigan and went in and they gave me the part. And it was so much fun. It was one of these like ripped from the headlines kind of movies of the week. It, I watched it recently. It's on YouTube, the whole thing. Oh, really? Yeah, I watched the What'd whole What did you think thing. of it? I, Tanya, completely ripped it off. The doc well, the story's the same. Sure, I mean, the story's but like story. they took the same approach from like the documentary I know. format. Maybe There's, they did. They did a lot. I have a feeling those people watched that. That's Maybe all I'm going to say. Did you see I, Tanya? Oh, yes. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah. You know, Nancy Kerrigan, I'm always playing the good girls, right? You know? Yeah. Named um, Nancy. <laughs> named Nancy. You know, the, the good girls get short shrift in this society. We all want everyone, we always kind of like want the story to be about, you know, the bad girl. And I can't imagine a more um, admirable character than Nancy Kerrigan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, too bad we don't make movies about people sure. like that. They're, I mean, people consider good girls boring. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to actually suffer that kind of injury and just say, screw it, I'm still going to, you know, win a gold, I mean, a silver medal at the Olympics. Yeah. and do that you know how hard that would be it's easy to do the easy way out or try to get the easy way out which maybe what tanya did but yet we think you know we're gonna make movies about her instead i need to know about this transition into special effects world. well it was, it was such a weird transition because um i mean people never believe me but i had a really hard time getting jobs was it hard to get auditions it was just hard yeah it was just really? hard so once I had my kids, I had two kids, Isabel and Atticus. My husband was doing Dawn of the Dead in Canada. And I said, you know, I think that we should just follow you up there and I'll be your assistant. You know, I'll run the shop and then he, you can just focus all on your designs and getting the stuff to set and doing the makeups on set. And so we made this partnership. It was, it was really seamless way to be together, have our kids with us and work really hard and that's when we started doing it and then it just kind of never ended though I kept thinking like oh I'll get another part I'll get a tv series or I'll do this but it just never happened so that was about 2002 we did Cinderella Man that way and then you know Star Trek we've done a lot of giant projects and then we started working for Eddie, Mur Eddie Murphy Ryan Murphy and um, so we started doing Ryan Murphy um, shows with um, Freak Show and you were in uh, well, I mean, I begged to be in that role because I, I was, I'm such a huge fan of Freak Show. And I just love Jessica Lange, Kathy Bates, and I just thought if there's a way that I can get on that set. So I had Aaron Kruger-McCash 
ask if I could be the extra and they were like, sure. Got to have my makeup done and, and get to wear those awesome like 50s outfits. And then I sat and, and just like wept watching Kathy Bates do her scene that day. Misery, of course, is like one of my very favorite movies. So that's to me, talk about fangirl. I just was like a total fangirl the whole day. So then finally we all get into our slit throat makeups and they're like, okay girls, let's get in the swimming pool. And I'm like, what? Oh, oh and it was freezing cold oh, and we're all like floating in the water in our makeups with our dresses on. And it was a cold, cold oh. night. And I remember thinking to myself, it is not fun to be an extra on these shows. I don't know why I thought it was going to be easy. It was so difficult. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Nightmare on Elm Street, all of the things I've done, by far, it was the hardest role I've ever played. Well, I think you probably said Eddie Murphy instead of Ryan Murphy but, because of Nettie Professor, yes. which is one of the Oscars. Right, that sits husband. on our, well, where is it sitting now? That's my it's question. It's probably, uh, we move it around a lot well, because of the fires. Like we have this whole, we, we put them in these bags and we put them away because we, we have to evacuate for fires, it seems like yearly now. So, yeah. so David, he worked with Rick Baker on two films and both won Academy Awards that Men in Black years. Too, Men right? in Black and Nutty Professor back to back, practically, I think it was. Were you at the Oscars? And yeah, so we got to go to both of the you Oscars. Were there. And amazing. then David and his dad were nominated for Cinderella Man. That's right. And so we got to go again. They're beautiful. You know, they really are beautiful. How soldiers. many times have you accepted for a part? <laughs> I, I don't dream about it because I think I think I know how hard it is to win an Oscar. It's lightning. You know, it's the chance of getting struck by lightning is probably greater than wow. the chance of winning an Oscar in LA. Don't mean to bring it up from a bitter standpoint, but I mean, Patricia Arquette went on to win one. I mean, is that... There's got to be a No, but I mean, she's so spectacular and... Um, well, she won for Boy. Boyhood, yeah. Boyhood. And that movie, to me, is like one of the most outstanding films of our era mm -hmm. and just what it accomplished. It was such an interesting film and she's an amazing actor. So yeah. I, I don't ever hold it against anybody for their ability to just channel their talents into wonderful projects. Do you remember the last time you saw her? Last time I saw Patricia was in the bookstore in Malibu and she gave me a book and it was a really touching moment because her son and my son are about the same age. I would. I visited her when her boy was born. She was pregnant soon after Nightmare 3 and had Enzo. And I had Atticus maybe a few months later. They had soccer teams together oh, and things like that, cute. like in the same kind of age group. So we were going through a lot of the motherhood things at the same time. But I, I saw her at this bookstore and we, we had a really nice moment. Were your kids and family, like, did, did they embrace this culture or? No. They did not, they, I didn't ever make them watch the movie and never made them know that I was an actor. I don't think my kids ever saw Nightmare on Elm Street until they like snuck out and watched it with their friends at a slumber party when they were 14 or whatever. I never really talked about it. I just, I knew that if they wanted to be an actor, I would know it by the way that they pursued their own trying out for the play or sure. I would never ask them, don't you want to try out for the play? I mean, I wanted them to develop their own personalities and I knew that I wanted to do that from the day that they were born. And so uh, my son went to Stanford, was an engineer, and my really? daughter um, is a, yeah, she's a singer and a photographer. And I don't know, but my son died of brain cancer. So um, I'm so glad that he was not ever, you know, had to model his life off of what I did. Or um, I just was so glad he was able to express his own personality. And that's that was one of the greatest successes I feel in my life is that he got to live his own life and never under any kind of shadow of mom or... And I know that happened recently and my heart just absolutely Thank goes you. out to you. I, I, you. I don't have the words. Yeah, I, it's a really hard, it's a, it's the hardest thing I've ever dealt with, obviously. But um, I mean, I always say learning the lessons of Freddie really helps me learn the lessons of how to face cancer. You have to face it and you just have to be really, really strong. 
So you are auditioning, you said, and you also yes. have a movie. Is it yes. Portal? So we got to talk about is it coming Portal? out or is it no, out? So it's out. It's streaming on services that I can't name off the top of my head. But, okay, people can um, find it. It's a really great story about these professionals who are looking for the haunted house. They go in and they take video and then they have a TV show and their show is about to be canceled. It's terrible. Their last episode, they have to like up their game. And in the process, my character survived the haunting thing that happened there. And I know that if they go in there and they wake the spirit, you know, that things are going to go really bad, really fast. And so, of course, I come in and I have to have scream. Of course, I do a big scream in the, in the episode. I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm still a scream queen. Can I get away from it? But um, in fact, when I saw the when I saw the trailer, they ended on my scream and I thought, oh, well, there they got their manicures right there. <laughs> Well, I like to end my show with something really silly. You don't even have to think about it. This just kind of gives us okay. a little peek into who you are. Okay. No right or wrong. I just like how you wrote the Justin Root show on the page. Hey, I love why it. do you think I wrote it and not one of my producers? I think it's just so, it's so great. The answer is I don't have one and I did write it. I know, I love it. You have, you have neat handwriting. Thank you. Watermelon or coconut? Oof, watermelon. 80s music or 90s music? Some of my music bridges both, but I'll say 80s. Halloween or Friday the 13th? Halloween. Houseplants or succulents? Succulents. Elton John or Billy Joel? Oh, Elton John. Champagne or wine? Champagne. Friends or Will and Grace? Friends. Queen Elizabeth or Princess Diana? Oh gosh, that's a toughie. I'm gonna say Queen Elizabeth. Comedy Meryl Streep or Drama Meryl Streep? <laughs> Drama, Meryl Streep. Plain potato chips or flavored? Flavored. And now I have to add one. Barbecue or salt and vinegar? Barbecue. <laughs> De Niro or Pacino? De Niro. Football or baseball? Baseball. Plays or musicals? Plays. Psychedelic furs or Depeche Mode? Psychedelic furs. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I'm such a nerd. I don't know why I love it. I do, do. I don't know why. I'm such a nerd. The Crown or Downton Abbey? Downton Abbey. Popcorn at the movies or candy at the movies? Popcorn. President Carter or President Clinton? Oh, that's tough because Carter. Because your dad worked under... Yeah, he was in the Carter administration, but then he also worked for Clinton too. Yeah. Taylor Swift or Ariana Grande? Ariana Grande. Fall or summer? Fall. Fleetwood Mac or Eagles? Mm, gosh. Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> Last but not least, Stevie Nicks or Stevie Wonder? Stevie Wonder. Very, very few people say that, but... Really? Yeah, I, I, I'm a huge, huge Stevie Nicks fan, that's why I remember that one. The rest I don't really remember, but well, I always... Well, <laughs> you know, they're all tough. I mean, it, it was not easy to make those decisions. <laughs> Some of them seem like I was fast, but they... There was a lot of analysis. I love going it. On. I love it. Well, I love that you're auditioning. I love that you're doing movies. I love that you're acting again. And well, I, thank I, you. I, I, I just think there's a lot more storytelling in there. I look forward to, um, yeah, pursuing my art forms. Where can people find you? Are you you're not very. I don't really like to do, but I have, social, I have my right? Twitter. I'd love to have more Twitter. Oh, followers. you're on Twitter. Okay, what's your? So I'm Langenkamp H. Okay. I love Twitter the most because. I always feel like it's totally breaking all the time. I'm probably going to start like an Instagram. Our studio, AFX Studio, has an Instagram. I just haven't needed to um, have that kind of feedback in my life. So. I love it. No, I, agree. I, agree. <laughs> I don't really, I don't really know if I, it's something that I want to pursue because I've realized how much time it takes. Yeah, it's a, and, it's a career. You know, <laughs> it's a career to do do it well. But I, you know, if you want to see what I'm doing, like where I'm going to be, you can always go to I am Nancy dot um, info. Oh, okay. Most people just use Instagram and call it a day. You actually get out there <laughs> and do the face to face encounters with these fans and you've been doing it for years at all over I the know. world. I mean, you're not just doing conventions in LA. You're going all over the country. You're going to Europe. No, I, I know. My husband gets mad that I go to so many, but you know, Robert England's my inspiration because he, the reason people consider this movie a classic now is because Robert England put in the time to actually make people love Freddy in a way that no one has ever done it before. You know, we got paid scale to do that job. He's like, make, you know, at least get paid back a little bit by coming out and meeting the fans and, and feel like, you know, 
you're contributing. Thank you again so much for coming on Thank here. Thank you, I Justin. Cannot. It's been so nice. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Congratulations I, on your show, and I hope that you meet with all the success of your dreams. Thank you so much. That means the world coming from you. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you guys for right. watching. Please subscribe.